All right, welcome everybody to our exam three review session for hematology two. I have sent out the PowerPoint that we are going to go through today in this review. Basically, the entire exam for this one that's occurring in week 10 will be over coagulation. So kind of from weeks seven and on. So seven weeks seven through nine, essentially, is what the exam will be based on. I am going to share my screen. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Again, for some reason it froze, so I'm never sure if it keeps recording or if it freezes the recording at the same time. But um, just in case it froze my recording, I'm going to say what I just said while it was frozen, which is the third exam for Heme 2 is based entirely on coagulation. So it'll be week seven through nine content. All right, so let's kind of get into this PowerPoint. So again, we need to still remember the names for our factors. This was shared in week seven. Um, we had a quiz on that, but basically I listed four random ones here, but there's much more than these four. Be sure you know the factor names. So if I say factor one, you should right away know factor one is fibrinogen. Factor two, prothrombin. Factor five is the labile factor. And factor 13 is the fibrin stabilizing factor. So again, make sure you go back to that list out of week seven and keep knowing the names for each one. Of course, we have to know our pathways. This is just one picture of the pathways, but you need to keep in mind what's involved in the intrinsic pathway, what's involved in the extrinsic pathway. And if I ask you to list out the steps, list all the steps. So when I say list out steps for pathways, we want them all. If we're just talking testing, it's a little bit different and unique there. So for example, in intrinsic, you should be listing 12 with HMWK, pre-K, 11, 9, 8, 10, 5, 2, 1, and 13. Because in the pathway, technically 13 is part of the pathway. 13 is not involved in the testing part, and so that's where it gets a little bit confusing, but the pathway itself, yes, it is involved there at the end. So the extrinsic pathway, a little bit shorter, it's 7, 10, 5, 2, 1, 13. So those are the two pathways. Keep knowing those steps in that order. Also keep in mind the testing. So we know that intrinsic pathway is measured by the APTT test. And the extrinsic pathway is measured by the prothrombin timer PT test. Also for blood thinners or um, basically like anticoagulants that people might be put on intrinsic or the APTT um, monitors heparin therapy and the PT test monitors Coumadin or what you can call warfarin therapy. The other test that's listed here in the black toward the bottom is called the thrombin time. Um, in this case, it's a thrombin clot time. Same thing as a TT thrombin time. Thrombin time, of course, assesses the ability from fibrinogen to form a fibrin clot. So if that is abnormal, it's something affecting your fibrinogen that, because it's not forming into that clot like it should. So maybe we're low in that fibrinogen level. So you have hypofibrinogenemia. Maybe you have fibrinogen, but it's not functioning, so that's the dysfibrinogenemia. And again, if somebody is on heparin therapy, that will prolong the thrombin time because of the heparin they're on. All right, so here's, again, that chart. We've seen this chart in one of the PowerPoints. I think it was in the um, first PowerPoint we had on COAG. So extrinsic, intrinsic, kind of laying them out. I did not put 13 on these, but please still be sure to list 13. In fact, I should probably make sure I change that, too. But, so, you could technically add 13 to these, and then with this one, it should be HMWK and Pre-K as well. All right, so you also need to know what activates each one of these pathways. So, extrinsic is activated by tissue injury, which will expose tissue factor, which is factor three, and then that jump starts everything. Intrinsic is activated by contact with a foreign object, and so that will go, and then again, we all know that there are oops, similar factors in each. Um, I was just kidding. So the ones that are the same in each are those common pathways, which would be 10, 5, 2, 1, and you can list 13. You don't have to on that one. And then do you know which factors is missing from both? Well, I added it in. If you just have to list the pathways, we want it in there. If we're talking about testing, 13 is missing because it is not 
not involved in testing, such as APT and PT. Remember, the test that does like look at factor 13 is the urea solubility test. So if we were concerned about factor 13 presence functioning correctly, we could do the urea solubility test to look at that. All right, some components that we have learned. So we have learned the contact factor group is 12, HMWK, Pre-K, and 11. These are the four that start the intrinsic pathway. And of course, intrinsic pathways started by contact with a foreign object, so they're considered the contact factors. Factor 13's entire role is to provide strength to the clot. That's why it gets the same fibrin stabilizing factor. That's what it does. We know that calcium and phospholipid is absolutely important to ever form a clot. They're spread throughout the pathways. We just don't list them out specifically. And remember, factor four is technically calcium on our chart. So we have learned that factor four is calcium. Von Willebrand factor, we've talked about this guy a lot. You've answered questions on him a lot. You should be pretty well versed on what it does. And it's platelet adhesion and then carries and stabilizes factor eight. And then finally, fibrinogen, of course, is what forms our fibrin clot, but it also plays a big role in platelet aggregation. Prothrombin group, I think we've answered this question a couple times. So again, that's made up of the factors 2, 7, 9, 10. So I always say 2 plus 7 is 9, and then 10 along for the ride, if you want to say that. These four are considered the prothrombin group because they are all four vitamin K dependent factors. And this is the whole premise on how Coumadin or Warfarin works to thin somebody's blood. Basically, Warfarin is a vitamin K antagonist. So by making it unavailable, you're not going to have these factors form and function the way that they normally do. And thus, you can't really form a clot. So that's how it keeps the blood thinner which without tendency to clot. So anybody that has like is prone to clotting might be put on Coumadin or Warfarin and then that helps them prevent the clotting formation by taking out two, seven, nine, and 10 factors by targeting that vitamin K. You have to know how warfarin works. So if it's an essay question, you need to be able to type it out a little bit. I don't expect like a paragraph, but I expect a couple sentences on how it functions. Thrombin, so thrombin is technically factor 2A. It's the activated form of factor two, because remember factor two is prothrombin. And then when it becomes activated, it's thrombin. Thrombin has a huge role in our body. It activates a ton of things. So thrombin actually will be the one that activates five and eight. If you've ever wondered, because they kind of are those ones that are at the odd place in the pathway, like, you know, it's kind of like off to the side if you technically draw the pathway out. They're not like totally a step on their own. And you probably have thought, well, how did they get activated? Because they're already activated when they come in. And that's because thrombin has already done that. So five and eight are already activated by thrombin. Thrombin actually technically activates 11. I know we show it down the pathway, but it does activate that. And then 13 is activated by thrombin. So those four factors are activated by thrombin. And then thrombin will also activate protein C after it binds with a substance called thrombomodulin. So very important role that thrombin plays, so keep that in mind. All right, so once we form the clots, got to get rid of it. We've discussed fibrinolysis pathway, very simplistic pathway here. The word fibrinolysis itself means breakdown of fibrin. So to get rid of the clot after we're done with it, we have plasminogen, which will form into plasmin, which will digest that clot. So just three basic steps. Of course, when you're digesting that clot, you get little pieces of it coming off that we have named fibrin degradation products. You can actually do testing on fibrin degradation products. One of those pieces that is commonly tested for is the DD or D dimer piece. And that's always a very good marker that thrombosis or clotting is occurring in a patient. It happens quite frequently. It's a very requested test, especially for somebody presenting to the ER and say they're presenting with some symptoms of a clot possibly, we order that, look at it if it's high or increased, that's a good indicator to the physician that yes, this person does have a clot present in their body. It might not say where, but the physician probably already kind of knows where because of the symptoms they're coming in with, so. 
All right, the other big thing with clotting is we have to regulate that process. So we know it activates our pathways. We know it gets rid of the clots at the end of them when we're done with it. But what keeps these pathways in check so that they don't keep going and get out of control? Because once you jumpstart your extrinsic or intrinsic pathways, eventually something's got to stop it. It doesn't stop on its own. It will keep going until one of these items stops it. So these are called inhibitors, but they're more like regulators, if you will. They're in place to make sure we put a stop when we're done. We don't need any more clots. Let's stop your pathway now so it doesn't keep going. So the first one is called the tissue factor pathway inhibitor. Tissue factor pathway, remember, is just another name for extrinsic pathway. So its whole goal is just to stop the extrinsic pathway, and it does that by inactivating factor seven. Remember, factor seven only belongs in the extrinsic pathway. So when it inactivates that factor seven, it will inactivate that whole pathway and put a stop to it. Protein C, when it binds with protein S, so remember, thrombin will activate protein C. When protein C becomes activated, it binds with that protein S, and then the two together will inactivate factors five and eight. So five is in both pathways, eight is in the intrinsic pathway. So that kind of helps put a stop there. And then the last one is antithrombin. The name itself tells you it targets thrombin. It's antithrombin. So we just learned that thrombin has a bunch of roles, right? Thrombin activates five, eight, 11, 13, and protein C. So if you take out and neutralize thrombin, thrombin can't activate the 5, 8, 11, 13. Well, that puts a stop to the pathway. It, antithrombin will also go and inactivate factors 9, 10, 11, and 12 as well. So that's a ton of factors that have now just become inactivated, and that definitely halts your pathways from clotting. So people kind of get these ones um, mixed up. These are ones that are a little harder for people to remember, understand. but the basic is they're regulators of our pathways so that we don't keep going on clotting. And you just need to remember which ones it goes in and activates in those pathways. All right, testing. We've been doing the PT and APTT test in our labs. Hopefully you've had fun with it. Um, some of you might not like it, that's okay. I personally love tilt tubes. Um, they're the oldest way to learn clotting testing, and it's what actually happens in your analyzers and how it looks for it. So it's nice to see it in the tube, what that kind of gelatin-like clot looks like when it occurs. So again, PT is testing the extrinsic pathway, which of course includes common. And again, that monitors Coumadin or Warfarin therapy. APTT is testing the intrinsic common pathway, and it monitors heparin. Thrombin time is looking at the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. We've already discussed this, but if it's prolonged, again, it's either something to do with your fibrinogen or it might be the patient's on heparin. Urea solubility is only looking for a factor 13 deficiency. The dimer, again, is telling us there's presence of clots. Bleeding time is only about platelet function. It has nothing to do with anything else in the body. About so if somebody's really low in platelet count or their platelet isn't functioning, that will prolong your bleeding time. The other thing to be aware of is if the patient is on aspirin, which there's a lot of older generation that takes aspirin for their heart every day, this will prolong the bleeding time as well. And then mixing studies. Mixing studies are done whenever we see that we have elevated PT or elevated PTT or both. Um, it's just kind of a way to dig in and figure out, okay, what factor might be deficient. Again, if the mixing study is correct at some point, that means there is a factor deficiency. If there is no correction with anything that the, it was mixed with, then you have an inhibitor, like one of those antiphospholipid antibodies present. And again, you have to know what's in each of the mixing study substances, so serum, H plasma, and absorbed. Each one lists what is in there and what it lacks. Um, you have to be able to know how to do a mixing study for this test. Work with your coordinator or your lab instructor. Um, you know, you can reach out, email me, just let us know. But you have to, in order to even know how to do the problem, you got to first memorize it. And that's the unfortunate reality of it, is it's a lot of memorization, and it is. So the way I've done it is for serum, I have memorized what's in serum because they know S, serum, 7, S and S. It starts with the same. 
So you know, seven and it's just nine through 12. So I'm looking at that everything else is missing out of it. Aged, for me, it was easier to memorize what was missing. It's only missing five and eight. It has everything else. So I just remembered it ha was missing five and eight and I knew everything else was in it. And adsorbed, again, it was easier for me to memorize that it was missing the prothrombin group, two, seven, nine, ten. That's that prothrombin group. And so then I knew it had to have the rest of it. So that's the way that I've kind of memorized it. But again, it's pure memorization. And then you have to do a problem. So if you're given a problem where it's saying, here's your PT result, your PTT results, and then here's your mixing studies results, you have to figure out what factor was missing or deficient. So right now we can do, I don't think I have any examples in this. But I will do an example or two with you. Now you might find this confusing because a lot of people find it very confusing at first. Just do your best, re-listen to the recording as much as you can, ask a classmate or your lab instructor if you need to. Some people will get this right away, others it will take you a bit. It's, um, so I'm gonna give you a couple examples. So if we have a patient and their PT was normal, so and their PTT was prolonged, or what you can call high. Remember, we're not, we don't care about anything low. We only care about the high results, the prolonged results. Okay. And then I'm going to do the mixing studies here. Okay. I just had to figure out what I was going to do it on. I didn't even have a thing in mind. <laughs> All right, so there's your test question, for example. So now, again, you gotta have that memorized to even know it, or at least have it set off to the side to do this. So the very first thing that you do is don't look at the mixing studies yet. Look at your PT and PCT results. So if you know the PT is normal, that means the extrinsic pathway was normal. Only the PTT was affected, so it has to be something in the intrinsic pathway that's a problem. And because both PT and common, it can be common. Because if it was 10, 5, 2, or 1 out of the common, both PT and APTT would have been prolonged. But since the PT is normal, it has nothing to do with the common pathway. So it has to be a factor unique to just the intrinsic. So that would be 12, 11, 9, or 8. So you notice I didn't, we're not going to do mixing studies for HMWK or pre-K or 13. Let me just disclaim that now. For the mixing study problems, do not worry about HMWK, pre-K, or 13. We're not going to worry about those for the mixing study problems. All right, so now that we've got it narrowed down to being one of these four factors that belong only in that intrinsic pathway tested by APTT, now we can go down to our mixing study step. So you can do this one of two ways. You can either start with the no corrections first, or you can start with the corrected. I just kind of go down the list. It doesn't matter to me, but some people always like to start with the no correction. Remember, if there was no correction, it means that it's one of the factors that is lacking. Factors that is lacking. Um, what? What? Are you gonna take the dog out first? Yeah. What time are you coming back? I'm just gonna take it. Okay. Are you already done recording? No, I paused it. All right. So again, if it is no correction, that is telling us that whatever factor is having a problem, that mixing item didn't have it either to make it work. So in the case of serum, because there's no correction, it means it doesn't have the factor that was causing the problem. It is one of the factors that is lacking. So in other words, you can rule out any factor that was present in serum. Because again, if it was one of them, then it should have worked and fixed it. So the factors that are in serum, again, are 7, 9, 10, 11, 12. So we can rule out... 
12, because that's in serum, if 12 was the problem and we were missing 12 and serum gave 12 back, it should have fixed it, but it didn't. It's still prolonged. So it can't be 12, can't be 11, because that's in serum, and actually it can't be 9. So you actually already have your answer. It was <laughs> That one was a little simpler in that it is factor 8, but let's keep going on this. Aged, same thing. Then it is one of the factors that is lacking. And remember, in aged, aged is only missing factors 5 and 8. So that actually makes sense. If factor 8 was deficient, aged didn't have factor 8 either to help fix it. So it, ha it makes sense. Adsorbed did correct. So that means it had the factor to fix it. So you can rule out the lacking or missing factors. So when you look at absorbed, eight was in absorbed. That's why it corrected. It gave it back and it fixed the problem. It corrected the prolonged PTT to make it run normal. That's what it means by no correction correction. We're rerunning that, that APTT test to see if it fixed it or not. So we take that patient sample, mix it with each item separately, like three different ways, rerun the pro PTT, and if it corrected, it made it work in a normal reference range time, then we know that it gave back one of the factors. So it corrected it, fixed the APTT test time because it gave it the eight that it was missing, so it worked right. So in this it is a factor eight. All right, so that's one example. Now, at this point, you may be like, I hate this. This just sucks. And other people might be getting it. It's okay if you're not getting it. Basically, it just takes a lot of time. So it just takes practicing these. So if you have a classmate that does understand this and seems to grasp it right away, have them give you practice problems like this. All right, so let's do this one. We have a PT prolonged, APTT prolonged. We'll do mixing studies. So serum corrected, aged corrected, and absorbed no noise. Yeah, no correction. Okay. All right, so again, first thing you always do is look at your PT and APTT test results. Both are prolonged. So that is telling you it has to be a factor that belongs in both pathways. And we all know the factors that are in both pathways are the common. So 10, 5, 2, 1. So we have it narrowed down to it's going to be one of those four factors. So now let's go to our mixing studies. So serum corrected, meaning it had the factor. So it's one of the factors that is in serum. Being that, you can rule out anything that was missing from serum. So again, serum is missing one, two, five, and eight. You can actually rule out one, two, and five because that's all missing from serum. So again, this one kind of solved itself. It's 10, but let's keep going. Aged, remember, had the factor because it was corrected. Remember, the only factors missing out of aged is five and eight. So it could not be five or eight. And adsorbed, no correction, so it has to be one of the missing factors because it didn't fix it, and 10 is missing from adsorbed, so it all comes together there. It was a factor 10 deficiency that was causing both tests to become prolonged. Okay, let's do another. Let me just write this all out. Okay. So, PT normal, APTT prolonged. So, again, it has to be one of the factors only existing in the intrinsic and not in both. So, that was 12, 11, 9, or 8. Those are the only four factors that would be in APTT and not in both. So, going to our mixing studies. 
theorem corrected, meaning it had it. So rule out the missing factors. So we know it, what's missing in serum is 1, 2, 5, and 8. Is any of these 1, 2, 5, or 8? Yes, we can rule out 8 right away because that was missing. So age corrected it. Again, it had it, so rule out the missing. But with age, the only thing missing was 5 and 8. So we already ruled out 8, so we know that can't be. So we still have 3 sitting ready. It comes down to adsorbed. Adsorbed is no correction, meaning it did not have it. So it has to be one of the missing factors because it didn't fix it, so it's missing from it. So you can rule out anything in adsorbed. So adsorbed is 1, 5, 8, 11, or 12. Well, if it was 11 or 12, that should have fixed it, but it didn't. So it has to be 9. 9 was missing from adsorbed. That's why there's no correction. So this answer is factor 9. All right. We'll do one more. Actually, we'll do two more. I just thought of something I wanted to do. Okay. Just have to deal with me typing here. Okay. So PT is prolonged, PTT is prolonged. Again, to have both be prolonged, it has to be one of the common, because that's in both. So that'd be 10, 5, 2, or 1. So we have our four choices. Once you have our four choices, let's go to the mixing studies. Serum, no correction, meaning it was missing it. So we can rule out the has. In other words, rule out anything in serum, because it was missing it. It didn't work. So again, serum has 7. 9, 10, 11, and 12 in it, so we can get rid of 10 because that was in serum. That would have fixed it if it was that. Age corrected it, meaning it has it, so rule out the missing. So again, um, aged is only missing 5 or 8, so you can get rid of 5. So we're down to two of them left. Adsorbed, no correction, meaning it was missing it. So it has to be, remember, what's missing in adsorbed is 2, 7, 9, 10. So you can rule out the rest. The ones that are in adsorbed is 1, 5, 8, 11, 12. So we can get rid of our 1. And 2 makes sense because if it was a factor 2 deficiency, adsorbed would have no correction because it's not in the adsorbed plasma. All right, so that's factor 2. Okay, so we're going to leave it at that for those. I'm going to do one more, though. This is going to be a briefer one. All right, so you have a PT prolonged, PTT prolonged. So right away you might be thinking, oh, it has to be one of the common. But when you go down to your mixing studies and you see all three did not correct, that's not a factor deficiency then. Something should have fixed. Something should have worked there if it was a factor deficiency. But since none of them worked, we know it's not a factor deficiency, and instead it is an inhibitor. So it's one of those antiphospholipid antibodies like anti like lupus anticoagulant or something like that. So there's something getting in the way of the testing to make it work. Something is causing a problem with the test, the PT and APTT testing to work. So anytime you see the mixing say is not correct, there's no correction, it's an inhibitor. And again, either both your PT and PTT could be prolonged or maybe it's just one of the tests. Maybe your PT was normal but the PTT was prolonged Again, if the mixing phase show no correction, it's still an inhibitor. So keep that in mind. Okay, so I think we've kind of delved into that as much as we can for review. I don't want to overwhelm you and I don't want to go on and on forever. So let's go to our next slide. So let's get into the disease portion. So these are some diseases that you definitely need to know and be aware of for the test. 
Von Willebrand disease, of course, is a Von Willebrand factor deficiency. So we know that Von Willebrand factor has a lot to do with platelet adhesion. So you're not going to have any platelet adhesion if you're missing Von Willebrand factor. If it becomes severe of a deficiency, it may affect the factor eight then availability as well. It just depends on how severe that deficiency is getting. Your PT is normal. PTT will be either normal or prolonged. It just depends on if factor eight got involved. If factor eight stayed normal, PTT will stay normal. If factor eight does become unavailable, it will prolong the PTT range. Thrombin time normal, bleeding time is prolonged because it has to do with no platelet adhesion. Bleeding time is all about platelet testing. That will prolong it. And again, anytime you have von Willebrand factor being affected, it will affect ristocetin. They are cofactors to each other. So ristocetin is an agent that we can add to platelet aggregation testing or platelet testing in general to see how the platelets are functioning. So if you add a patient's platelets with ristocetin, and they are missing von Willebrand factor, it's not gonna work because they're a cofactor, they need each other. So it will have no response to resistance. And D-dimer normal has nothing to do with clots in this disease. So your main test results to know for von Willebrand is prolonged bleeding time so that bleeding, that platelet function is not good, no response to ristocetin, and then sometimes the PTT can become prolonged if the factor eight becomes out of whack. DIC is the one that's the, all the clots throughout the body and you don't even know what's happening for a while and all of a sudden then it results in one big massive hemorrhage. It's just a basic continuous activation of your coid system. They're constantly activating and forming clots and you're using up everything that you have in those clots. So typically the patient has something other going on. So some sort of leukemia, sepsis, something like that is happening that kind of triggers this to start. The big thing with DIC is all the test results are abnormal. So all of your coag testing is abnormal. Your fibrinogen levels are low because we've used up all the fibrinogen in the clotting. Your platelets are all used up in that clotting as well. And then of course, your D-dimer is going to show that there are clots in the body. So everything is abnormal. Hemophilia is specifically um, Factor deficiency, A is eight, nine is, or B is nine, C is 11. Um, these are all three sex-linked inherited recessive disorders. Basically diagnosed within the first few years of life, typically males because it is a sex-linked kind of inheritance. Deep joint muscle bleeding, not like the surface bleeding, that's the difference because it is a coag factor that's missing. So all three, eight, nine, 11 are only found in the PTT test so it's only that test that will become prolonged. And then you can measure the levels of each factor to determine which one it was. Thrombocytopenia, that's just kind of a low platelet count in general, goes along with a ton of disorders. We see that with so many things, there's examples here at the bottom of different disorders that will have a low platelet count, but the list goes on and on. So again, any time that you are low in platelets, you're gonna have what we call mucocutaneous bleeds, more surface bleeding. So petechiae, purpura, ecchymosis, epistaxis, these are all examples of the mucocutaneous bleeds. We gave pictures and examples of these in the PowerPoint on this, so you can go back and look at that. Thrombocytopenia is the number one coag abnormality that exists because it does just go along with so much. On the flip side, we had clot forming or thrombosis diseases. Uh, we had a whole PowerPoint on this in week eight, so please go revisit that if you like. We talked about factor five Leiden, inhibitor deficiency, um, antiphospholipids like lupus and anticoagulants, having too much fibrinogen, so hyperfibrinogenemia. So these are all examples of clot forming diseases. Again, you can go back to that week eight chapter PowerPoint. Week nine, we learned Bernard Soulier and Glanzman. Bernard Soulier and Glanzman are both missing a platelet receptor. It's just a different one in each. So Bernard Soulier is missing glycoprotein 1B95 receptor. That is the platelet receptor for von Willebrand factor. As a result, we cannot have platelet adhesion if you cannot bind the von Willebrand factor to the platelet to do the job. So you will see again, prolonged bleeding time because there is abnormal platelet adhesion. All of your coag tests are gonna be fine. It has nothing to do with anything coag related. You still have 
von Willebrand factor present in your body, it's just the receptor for it that's missing. This one you do see a low platelet count and giant platelets with. And so then when you go to do the platelet activating agents and you're mixing them with different substances to see what works and what doesn't, remember because the von Willebrand factor can't bind to the platelets and we're having a problem with that, the ristocetin will also be abnormal. So the two always kind of go hand in hand. Glansman is missing the receptor glycoprotein 2B3A. That is a receptor for a few things, but it's a main receptor for fibrinogen. Remember, fibrinogen plays a role with platelet aggregation. So if you don't have platelet aggregation, you're not going to have your platelets function here either, so you'll get a prolonged bleeding time. Again, all of your CoA tests will be normal. has nothing to do with that. Your platelet count will still be normal in this one too, so that's a little different. And then when you go to add those platelet activating agents, they will be abnormal for all of them. They're not gonna aggregate with any of them, except they will be normal with ristocetin. Von Willebrand factor is not affected here, so ristocetin will still work. The other key test to glansman is that abnormal clot retraction. So it's what we call an in vitro clot retraction, meaning in the test tube. It just doesn't retract the proper way when you're dealing with not having the fibrinogen it's kind of an abnormal test, um, a little harder for me to explain, but that's also a key test for Glansman. These three, lots of initials, I know, or abbreviations, however you want to say it, ITP, TTP, and HUS. ITP was immune thrombocytopenic purpura, so it's all about antibodies that are kind of destroying your platelets, leading to a low platelet count. Lots of times it's linked to a viral infection, especially for children in acute ITP. Um, it will just kind of go away on its own. TTP is a thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, so it's a type of maha in which you have clots present. That's the part, the first word there is thrombotic for clots. And because these clots are occurring inside the vasculature, it's causing a hemolysis because it's shredding the red cells when they're trying to get around those clots. So you will see schistocytes and signs of an intravascular hemolysis. The key signs to TTP is Besides the thrombocytopenia, there is some renal failure, and then the big one is neurologic abnormality. So if those small clots are kind of up in the brain or in the nervous system area, um, that sounded weird, nervous system area, but like if they go up and they're kind of in the brain, it'll lead to neurologic abnormalities. That's why that gets involved. Hus, hemolytic uremic syndrome, another type of MAHA. So again, it's still a hemolytic process with some clots. This case is usually caused by E. coli, O157, or Shigella infections, which are very severe, severe diarrheal infections. Um, this one, we have very severe renal failure. That's what the middle word, uremia, is standing for, is that significant renal failure. And then, of course, the low platelet count, which is why we're talking about it in hematology. All right, so that was a lot of info. I'm, you know, I'm tired of talking <laughs> with it all. Um, Lots of stuff, just do the best you can. Unfortunately, it is a lot of memorization. Make sure that you can separate the diseases. So if you're getting test results, you just need to know the key test that will occur in each disease to kind of know which one is which. But do the best you can. Um, email me if you do have any questions. Otherwise, you know, good luck with everything, and I hope you guys have a fabulous week. Thanks.